Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna look at some some more optimization problems. So remember, optimization is all about either making a variable get the biggest possible it could be or the smallest possible it could be. Uh, there's some quantity we're trying to make big or get small, and so I'm to figure that out in this lecture. So for this first example, uh, imagine that a man launches his boat from point A on the bank of a straight river three kilometers wide and wants to reach a point B, which is eight kilometers downstream on the opposite bank as quickly as possible. So imagine like he's in a race, um, th this athlete's in a race and part of the race is he has to cross this river and he has to row across the river in order to do it. Well, he could row his boat directly across the river to some point C and then run directly to B. So one option is he just goes directly across the river, whoops, directly across and then runs the whole way. Now that right there already is going to maximize the distance that he travels. So that might not be the best idea. Uh, another option is that he could row directly to the point B from A. That would actually minimize distance if he did that. Or an, one other option is he could go from A to some point D in the middle and then rest, run the rest of the way. That is, some of the time could be in the water, some of the time could be on land. Well, what's the best option here? Well, it depends on what's he trying to optimize. If he's trying to if he's trying to minimize distance, he should row directly to A from A to B. If he's trying to maximize distance, he should go from A to C and then to B. But he really is trying to do it so that he can get there as quickly as possible. Quickly as possible means that this man, this athlete here, is trying to minimize time. He wants the shortest time. He's in a race. It doesn't matter about distance. It doesn't matter about speed. It matters by time. How can you get there faster? Now, admittedly, speed and distance will affect these things. Um, and so that's how he's going to make this decision. Well, so if the man can row at a rate of six kilometers per hour, six kilometers per hour is his rowing speed. And then he can run eight kilometers per hour. So he can run faster than he can row. So there is a benefit of having a lot of running distance and cutting the, the cutting the rowing distance short. But if he cuts the rowing to distance, he adds a lot of extra uh, a lot of extra distance along the journey. And so it might not be the right thing. How does he how does he optimize all these things together? Well, so he has to decide how far is he going to row down the river and how much is he going to run. So imagine that. If you think of just the horizontal distance, the distance between the point C and D, call that X. Well, if the total distance between C and B is 8, then we see that the distance from D to B will be 8 minus X. And how about the distance from A to D? Well, as this is part of a right triangle, one side is X, the other side is 3, the distance along the diagonal is going to be the square root of X squared plus 9. Just using the Pythagorean equation right there. And so if you try to calculate time, uh, we often use the following rate formula where distance equals rate by time, that is speed times time. If we try to minimize time, we can solve for this by taking distance over your speed that's equal to your time, right? But there's really two parts of this question. The total time is gonna represent the time that he's in the water plus the time that he's on the land. Now, I imagine there might be some math professor who just died somewhere because of a lot of how I wrote this equation. Land plus water equals time. What the heck does that even mean? Uh, it is somewhat nonsensical, but uh, we I, I think it's not a bad practice to sort of write these simplistic equations and add details and specifications later on so that we can get a good intuition of what's going on here. Um, and then we can add more details. So there's the time he spends on land and there's the time he spends on the water there. Well, if we look at the water time a little bit more, there's the distance over the water, which we found out a moment ago was the square root of X squared plus nine. And this will be measured in kilometers. And this will be divided by his speed on the water, which was six kilometers per hour. And then there's the, dis or this, the time he spends on land, which the distance he spends on land is eight minus X. And then he runs at eight kilometers per hour. Now, admittedly, there might be other ways of setting this problem up. I did choose the variable X to be the distance between C and D to try to simplify the forthcoming equation, uh, this, this equation right here, this optimizing function. Uh, but one could two other, uh, 
could have made other choices as well. Now, as every optimization problem, it always has an optimizing function. This is the function we just built. And honestly, I think building the optimizing function really is the hardest part of an optimization problem. Um, the calculations of the derivative are fairly routine. And then there's always a constraint. And the constraint that comes into this problem, of course, are the distances involved, but also the speeds that the, the man can run or row. So if we take the derivative of time with respect to our choice x here, right, uh, we're going to get 1 sixth. Take the derivative using the chain rule right here. We're going to get 1 half x squared plus 9 to the negative 1 half power times that by a 2x, the inner derivative. And then over here, we're going to get 1 eighth times the derivative, which would be negative 1. We're taking the derivative with respect to x here. Uh, simplifying some things, for example, this 1 half cancels with the 2 right here. And, well, I mean, we can write things as fractions again. Uh, we're going to have an x on top for the first piece, and then we get 6 times the square root of x squared plus 9. And then we subtract 8 from that. And this is our t prime. We're looking for critical numbers right now. Set this equal to 0. And so you don't necessarily have to worry about set, cleaning up the derivative too much. Simplification is not a big deal. Just start, start solving for x right here. And if you do that, you're going to get x over 6 times the square root again. And this will equal 1 eighth. And so my recommendation here is, since we have a, a proportion equal to a proportion, let's cross multiply. Like so. This is going to give us 8x is equal to 6 times the square root of x squared plus 9. I don't really like the square root involved there, so I'm going to square both sides. One should always be cautious, though. When you start square rooting, uh, start squaring things, excuse me, you might add extraneous solutions into the system, that is, these party crashers, solutions who weren't invited. Uh, but we'll just check our answer before we're, before we're done here. And so if you square both sides, we get 64x squared is equal to 36. Don't forget to square that. x squared plus 9, like so. Distribute the 36 on the other side, of course. Oh, I guess actually before before we distribute, I take that back. Um, it's always better, I think, to, to divide before you can multiply if there's some common factors. Because after all, 64 and 36 have a common divisor. Uh, let's see, 36 is 4 times 9. And 64 is 8 squared, which means it is just 4 times 16. So you can cancel out the 4s there. And so we end up with 16x squared is equal to 9x squared plus 9. Now distribute. You get 9x squared plus 81. If you subtract 9x squared from both sides... All right, you're going to get 7x squared equals 81. That is x squared equals 81 over 7. And if you take the square root, you're going to get 9 over the square root of 7. This is our critical number. But there are some domain concerns we should have, x and t. So 9 over the square root of 7 sits in the middle. But what are the, what's the domain right here? Uh, if we come back to the original picture, let me bring our, the slides here. The original picture, well, we kind of talked about the two extremes one could take. One could take the journey where you just go directly across the water to C. That would be setting X equal to zero, right? Um, the other possibility of extreme is you take A directly to B, in which case that would be taking X equal eight. And so that's going to be the domain of the problem here from zero to eight. Zero, eight, and beware, nine divided by the square root of seven is approximately 3.4 kilometers, so it does sit inside there. If you set x equal to zero, plug x back into the original function, um, you're going to get the square root of zero squared plus nine, that's a three over six. Three over six gives us one half, so 30 minutes he'll spend on the water. 30 minutes on the water. And then 
he has to run eight kilometers and he can run eight kilometers per hour. So that's one hour right there on the land. And so he'll spend one and a half hours if he just rows directly across. If we did the other extreme where we did eight, right? Um, that the, the land part's easy. You're gonna get zero hours on land. Uh, but in terms of going across the water, if you plug in the eight, you get eight squared plus nine. Uh, take the square root uh, and then divide by six in that situation. You're going to get the square root of 73 over six, which that's approximately 1.42 hours. Let me lower that a little bit. 1.42. And so that is a little bit better. It is better for the, for the man to row directly across than or directly it's better for him to go entirely across the water than to go directly across because he does shave off a few minutes there. But if you were to plug in nine over the square root of seven, you actually end up with one plus the square root of seven over eight if you want an exact answer. In terms of approximation though, you'll get 1.33. So about an hour and 20 minutes. And so that's gonna be our optimal situation right here. This is the fastest approach. Uh, he should actually go approximately what we say before 3.4 kilometers down the stream and that can that'll save this man a couple of minutes right so because after all the 1.5 would be an hour and 30 minutes 1.33 is about an hour and 20 minutes and so by this strategy as opposed to just taking the first option he saves himself about 10 minutes um, he's not going to get as good with this option but he does still save himself about five or seven minutes in which case this is still a better solution um, after all, the man's in a race right here. He wants to he wants to win the race. And so saving those couple minutes could be very, very useful. Now, of course, you'll notice we spent like 10 minutes on this problem itself. <laughs> so if his point was to sit down, solve the problem uh, to save time, clearly that didn't work for him. He would have been better just making a bad choice than trying to sit down and solve the problem. But really, most likely for our for our athlete here is he knew the track long before he actually ran it. And so they could actually, he and his team, his coach could sit down and figure out what is the best strategy to take for this prior to getting there. And so this is the thing that sometimes gives calculus a bad name and other mathematical problems is we realize how long it takes to solve the problem. And some people are like, oh, I would have been faster if I just guessed and checked, right? In some situations, yeah. And in this situation, yeah. If he was in the middle of the race, it would not have been profitable for him to stop and solve this calculus problem. But if he could have done this prior to the race, he could have saved himself a lot of time that might make the difference in this competition. So mathematics is about planning ahead, uh, defining good solutions here. Optimization is all about that.